Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us here today. Um, my name is Leah Hines. I'm the executive director of the Charleston Conference, and I'd like to welcome all of you to Transform Your Catalog, One University's Experience with BibFrame-Based Discovery. Uh, this is a Charleston Conference webinar that is sponsored by Innovative. Uh, thank you to everyone who's here, and thank you to the Innovative for sponsoring today's session. Um, so up first, I would like to do just a quick um, mini tutorial here for uh, Zoom. Oops, my screen sharing has stopped. That's great. <laughs> Give me just a second. Um, if you've never used Zoom before, it's super easy. Um, hopefully you're all connected already and you're ready to go with your audio, but I wanted to share just a few things quickly, um, just in case you're not familiar with the program. So if you're already connected, it will tell you um, to connect through your computer speaker system. It's gonna give you the best audio. Um, it'll give you a little uh, option to check your speakers, make sure the sound's good. If you're having problems, you can connect through your telephone. There's also a phone option where you can call in. Um, but if you have issues, you can send me a note through the attendee and I'll try to help you sort out any technical difficulties that may arise. Um, at the bottom of the screen, you can see there's a little icon where you can raise your hand. If you click that, it'll turn green. Again, if you have a question or an issue, you can raise or uh, lower your hand. Sometimes the presenter may ask a question if you, you know, raise your hand if you've experienced this. So you can click that or lower it um, that way. Next to that is going to be the best option for you to submit questions for us. Um, we're going to hold Q&A till the end for both of our presenters. So as questions come to mind while they're speaking, while they're presenting, if you want to ask, you can type in your question using that Q&A box um, and we'll hold those questions until the end. But that way you don't forget about it. You don't have to worry about trying to remember at the end. What was that that I wanted to ask? You can type it as it comes up and send it to us. So input your questions and comments, hit send and we'll hold that till the end. There's also um, an attendee chat there at the bottom that you can use again if you have questions and um, the session is being recorded so it will be available on the conference website within just a couple of days. Um, up first we'll have some introductions. Um, so joining us today we have Martha Rice Sanders who is Senior Consultant and Innovative. Thank you for being here Martha. Um, she specializes in training and consulting services on metadata, authority control, and electronic resources management. She joined Innovative in 2016 after working in academic libraries and library consortia for over three decades, performing cataloging and authority work, as well as managing bibliographic and coverage data for electronic resources. She's presented at numerous conferences on authority work and electronic resource management, in 2009, she received the New England Technical Services Librarians Award for Excellence, and in 2014, the Beacon Award from the Innovative Users Group. Currently, she serves as past chair of the Alex Lita Authority Group Interest Group and as the Sky River representative to the PCC Policy Committee. So thank you very much for being here with us today, Martha. Up next, uh, Stephanie Caselli, who is Library Director at Cairn University. Uh, she's worked at Cairn in Langhorne, Pennsylvania since 2001 and is currently the director of Maslin Library there. Working in a small academic library has kept her busy managing the library systems and resources from A to T, acquiring to teaching. So thanks for being here with us, Stephanie. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand it over to, oh, actually, I forgot. I have a couple of poll questions before Stephanie gets started. So. Um, you should be able to see the questions up quickly. What type of attendee are you? You can let us know if you are a librarian, what type of librarian you are, um, or a publisher, vendor, or consultant, or other. If you choose other, let us know in the attendee chat what that is. We're curious to see what that might be. And then the second question, if you're a librarian, which area pertains most closely to your job duties? So administration, acquisitions and serials, cataloging and authorities, collection development, digital asset management, patron services, circulation, ILL, public services or reference or tech services. So I'll give everybody just a few seconds to fill those out. Um, looks like right now we've got mostly academic librarians, 65, 66% academic, a few public librarians, a few other librarians, um, again, um, I'd be interested in the in the chat there with the other, we've got a systems librarians person, 
reference, patron service, academic library assistant, teaching library technology, uh, academic special law. Thank you for everybody that, that let us know what the other uh, categories are there. So it looks like just about everybody has answered. Things are slowing down a little bit. Um, I'll give it a few more minutes here. Let's see what this is in the chat. Public library application manager. Systems librarian in a public library. LIS educator. Thanks to everybody for their input there. All right, I'm going to end the polling here and that will show you the results. So we had 58% academic librarians and then the biggest category for your job duties was cataloging or authorities. So with that, now <laughs> I will officially turn things over to Stephanie. Um, and I appreciate all of you and your input for those poll questions. So th thank you very much and take it away, Stephanie. Okay, hello everybody. Um, thank you, Leah, for that introduction and for the polls. Um, I just wanted to th say thank you for this opportunity to talk about in Inspire. In reality, I could probably go on for hours and hours about our journey and what we think of Inspire, but I am gonna try to keep it as close to 20 minutes as possible. I also need to say, I never thought I'd get the chance to present with Martha, Mar Martha Rice Sanders. So thank you, Martha, for letting me um, present with you. I'm excited to be sharing this time. Um, so Inspire at Cairn. And a bit basically, what, why did we want to do Inspire Discovery? Um, it kind of is underlaying the whole principle of why we're doing this is actually answered in the white paper that Innovative published a little bit ago, um, which I had read after I came to the conclusion about um, how our library tools are just not very easy to use and how our users were finding that so. Um, so when I read this, I felt like Innovative had talked to our customers. Uh, about a week before I received results from our Office of Research and the library is usually one of the top performing top ranking departments in all of our surveys that we put out. But this time somebody added a question for all departments about ease of use and um, frankly we kind of tanked in that for um, some of our constituents and my first reaction was probably not the best reaction. I was a little angry that they went ahead and um, added a survey question without us knowing and without us being able to tweak it a little bit. And, um, but then I started thinking about it and realized that we needed to listen to what our patrons were saying and take a look at what makes the library hard to use and being willing to hear about what makes the library hard to use. So again, why inspire? Um, Frankly, it's not because I just want to do something different or get to talk on webinars or anything like that. Um, we don't need any more work to do. Um, we, we're a very small library with a very small staff. So we try to do a lot, but we have a lot to do. So it's not that reason. But when we sat down and we discussed why Inspire for our staff, we decided that we want our resources to be discoverable in a way that encourages that curiosity, that serendipity that we've kind of gone away from in the midst of our discovery services. Um, we want something that leverages as much of our resources as possible and that is vendor neutral. We don't, um, we, we just want more vendor neutrality so all of our results are bubbling up. Uh, we want our metadata, the metadata that we spend a lot of time and a lot of money in improving and enhancing and making sure it's consistent and, um, and is per the authority standards. We want that metadata to be mined in a way to uncover the richness of our collection and the depth of our collection. And then finally, we want our students to spend their time poring over the resources, the articles, the books, the essays, and not endlessly searching for these resources. We don't want them to be so frustrated that by the time they get to their resources and to read them, they're kind of exhausted. So we want it to be a little easier on the front end there. So what is our impression of Inspire? And I really think of Inspire as our journey, 
getting to the point where we are now. Because um, in May, June 2018, this was a, the very beginning of a lot of the conversation around Inspire. There were some mock-ups, but nothing with real data. And um, Innovative knows I'm sharing this screen. <laughs> I always have to say that. Um, so my first impression every time we talked about um, Inspire was meh. Like we really were just kind of like, so what? Why do we want another discovery search engine that we want to, to look at? Um, and so basically in this, we found that there was not a lot of data. So there's not a lot of data in the linking going on. We had some questions about the print books and our print collection and mark. And if it's gonna be bib frame, what in the world are we going to do to get our records ready for that? Um, we're pretty steeped in mark here. Um, and then the th other part of this is we have a faculty member at Cairn and his wife is a librarian elsewhere and they attend ALA every year. And he always goes and spends most of his time on the exhibit floor. And every year he asks me what to, what to check out, what vendor, what product he wants me to take a look at. He's kind of like our little undercover spy. And um, I always appreciate his feedback. So I asked him to check out the innovative booth and to check out some other places. And he came by my office and I asked him how it all went. And the first thing he said is I stopped by the innovative booth like you asked and I took a look at their new discovery thing. And I said, oh, okay. And what did you think? And he says, meh. And I'm like, oh, okay. I'm not the only one. Um, but then he goes, oh, but oh, did you see this product from this vendor? So we went off on the other thing and kind of just left the Inspire thing where it was. Um, and I truly thought that was it. But I kept listening and, and going to webinars and talking to staff and talking to different people. And the second impression is around November 2018, where um, Inspire had a little bit more time to mature and started thinking, hmm, this actually could be something. And um, we then signed on to be a development partner. And once we did that, we were able to get our data in. And so our third impression came around January 2019. We were about a month in as being a development partner and our data started coming in. We got on the sprint cycles, which we'll talk about in a moment. Patron account was brought in. Um, articles, very little at a time, but we're starting to get loaded, the metadata, and getting matched with our entitlements. And then we started to see that linked data and bib frame idea and the concept, not just being a concept, but really paying off. So at that point, I started humming this, and I kid you not, I started humming, something tells me we're onto something good. And every so often I'd be working with our data, and I'm like, oh, that's kind of cool. And um, so that's the best way I can explain what our third impression of Inspire was. Then in um, February 2019, we're doing all of this work with Innovative on calls, um, going through the cycle with the, um, the sprint cycles. And, you know, we were debating some issues and we thought, you know, we're really early in, but let's see what the, our students say about this. Um, and surprise, like we thought maybe they would like it or they'd give us or they or they would hate it and we'd be done. But surprise, they actually loved it. Um, there was a huge, um, the, the students were just really excited for this new interface, but not just the interface. They actually found resources, even at this early stage, that they didn't know we had. Um, they, they said the context wheel, which we'll show in a little bit, was a great place to explore topics and go different directions. And then the workbench, which is there, it's no longer like a saving to a folder. It's literally a workbench where they can move things around and they can interact with it and have more than just titles. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. So all of these things, it really made us think, you know what, we really are onto something good. And the students are really, um, enjoying this because they're finding what they need. So in June 2019 rolls around and the same faculty member went to the innovative table at ALA and I actually never told him that we were a development partner. I just said, hey, head, head over to the innovative table, see what's going on, tell me what you think about the product a year later. 
And then his response, I didn't have to wait for him to come back from ALA. He actually emailed me and his response was, wow. And he did say, wow, it wasn't all blue and colorful, but it had lots of exclamation points. And he just, he could see the change. And that was really um, encouraging because he was somebody who hadn't interact with, interacted with it for a year. And so from one year, he could actually really start to see that vision come into fruition, really. And so one of the things that was a light bulb for me, um, not the most academic of books, but um, we're going on a book or bear hunt. Um, I needed to get um, a copy of our book, we, we're going on a bear hunt into a different location. And I knew we had the book because I had it in front of me. There was a barcode. I like to type in titles at times or type in authors and see how everything's working. It's kind of how I multitask being systems person too. And so I typed in, we are going on a bear hunt. Unfortunately, I'm Austinized and I do not use contractions when I type. So I just typed in, we are going on a bear hunt. And I couldn't find it in our Sierra. So in our catalog, because there was no 246 in the mark field. So if there's no 246 in the mark field, we are going on a bear hunt is actually not findable to our patrons. And I thought my first instinct is always just to go in and fix it and add that 246. But I said, no, wait, let me see this in terms of the patron. And I typed in, we are going on a bear hunt in our library catalog and lo and behold, no results were found. Um, that's not great. But I thought, well, let me see what Inspire does with this. So I typed in the same thing in Inspire and the first result is actually the book. And um, because of how they're searching and how they're doing things, it actually <laughs> kind of knew what I needed and it brought it to me. And that was a big light bulb in my mind um, for why um, Inspire kind of is getting it right. Um, so with that, I wanted to talk a wee bit about our partner process that we've found with Innovative because in a lot of ways it's very different than um, other um, processes that I've gone through with, with Innovative in the past. Um, and so this is basically just the cycle. But what you don't know here is that in this cycle, it's actually a two week cycle um, of sprints. And each sprint is a two week period and basically the latest code gets installed and then we use and test and we hit it as hard as we can based on the academic calendar, of course. And then there's comments, discussions, debates on Slack about different things that we're seeing or finding. And then we have a development call with staff from the other library site that we're kind of partners together with all of this. And then, um, and then we have the Slack conversations continue and at times we work with individual innovative staff, either as a group or one-on-one. -on -one. And a really good example of this is with um, course reserves. Course reserves started where a couple of the innovative developers and I got on a call. They wanted to see our screen, our Sierra instance, how we do reserves in the back end. And from there, they started building reserves into Inspire Discovery. And then I worked with other innovative staff on other pieces of reserves. And to the point that I didn't even know that they were so far along, we were in an update with a lot of other sites and all of a sudden they showed the course reserves that was coming out in the next week. And there were our professors and our books and course reserves is um, actually doing really well um, within Innovative Inspire. So that was, a cool um, way to see the process working and working well. And then the workbench is another um, area that works well. This had a, we, this was very, um, it was very brief and very rudimentary when it first came out, but now it's a place where students can really do a lot. They can select different things here and then they can um, select, send to the context wheel. They can get rid of things. They can move things around, it, it's actually a rich share things. And it's just a really rich opportunity for them to combine search terms or resources and then see what else is relating. Um, so the context, so, so the workbench has been a huge hit for our students. 
And then another thing I really wanted to show, and this kind of brings the whole sprint and us working with, um, with Innovative, is the work roll-ups that's happening right now. Um, and I love the fact that there's no more one or separate record debate needed. Um, so for the journal 16th century journal, we actually have two mark records in our system, but the patron doesn't see two separate entries. They see one with the title and then the different works are in tabs. Um, and then for our book on the right hand side, Our Lives, Our Fortunes, we have an ebook. We have several ebooks, one tab though, and then we have print. And um, so the students don't need to scroll through and keep seeing the same results over and over again, which I think is, is helpful. And then finally, the other part of work rollups, which um, is very new, is um, now for different editions, you can go ahead and see that. So we have, it's the same title, the same author, but different editions, and it's one record. And here in what they call the drawer, it actually has the different editions listed for, for the patron. Um, and then the, the search experience that, um, I'm actually, has been a really interesting thing, and I'm mentioning it because the updates that have happened with Innovative here at, on, on this level have been kind of the greatest received search tools for our students, and um, it's been encouraging. And so I type in Alexander Hamilton. There's gonna be pre-populated search results underneath. I cut those out, but you also get up at the top, view the person, or it'll be view the topic and whatever that topic is. And when you click on that, you're then going into Alexander Hamilton and you can see all of the resources that directly relate to Alexander Hamilton. I can also go to the context wheel or I could pin this onto our workbench or I could share this with, with people. Um, but then if you scroll down, here you have related people. So all of the different people who are related to Alexander Hamilton are here. And then you have topics and there's 60 different topics that Alexander Hamilton is related to in some way. And so if I type, um, just click the Statesman United States biography, up here you have um, the resources and I can see the rest of them here. Or if I wanted to, I could click the context wheel and bam, it explodes out and it now lists the people that are related to Statesman United States biography and then the topics are on the right hand side. So this is like a great, the students have really found this to be helpful to find sources that they didn't know we had or articles or, um, or just everything that we have. So they've been really excited for that. And then we move into feedback because of course, if we're doing this for anybody, it's for our customers and our customers happen to be our um, faculty, students, and staff at Cairn. And um, I just, every so often I'll be walking around and I'll just ask somebody who I know has used this, what do you think about Inspire? So I asked one student, truly a cold ask, what do you, what do you think about Inspire? And her response, or most of the response is like, oh, that innovative thing. <laughs> and um, yes, that innovative thing. And this one student without really of a hesitation just said, I love that I can find connections to a topic without leading to confusion. And then I get them the deer in the headlights. I'm like, well, can you explain that to me? Um, tell me more. And um, she used this example, the New Testament. And when she searches for the New Testament, she can find resources, but then she can start searching. And she said, I, I use this record, Empire in the New Testament. And then I'm gonna do a wee bit of an aside here and then get back to the, the real thing. But um, afterwards, I went in and looked at what she would see as a patron on our catalog today. And this is what you see, you'll get our subject terms and then you get our authors. And there's only a couple authors listed there. Um, well, when I go to the context wheel from Inspire, it's not just the Porter and Westfall that we're seeing. We're actually seeing all the other authors or um, that are listed in other author fields, as well as in the 505, which is, ta-da, what a great thing. And then that brings out Mark Boda that she might not have known was associated with this, and she could search 
on resources that he's written or about him. But she then said, I was able then to go into, well, I maybe not need so much the New Testament. I need more Old Testament. So she was able to go into Old Testament. And when you click that, it opens up this card and then you refocus the context wheel. And then you have an updated context wheel based on this new search. So there's that. Um, so she was really happy and um, content. Well, she really, in, she enjoys how the search is helping her explore more, but not get so convoluted or go off so off topic. And then also the results are, um, they're manageable. And that was good. And then the other part of the feedback, the other kind of feedback I love is the unsolicited feedback. And I've got gotten unsolicited feedback here here and there on like different things we've done or how we're doing. But I love getting that unsolicited feedback. And the last time I got a lot of really good, positive, unsolicited feedback before we did Inspire was Open Athens. And it made me think about that. And I thought, well, that was yet another thing that simplified the user experience and that they appreciate that and they notice that. Um, so I was working behind the front desk and a student stopped me and said, hey, Stephanie, I love this new innovative thing. And I'm like, oh, really? Tell me more. So she explained to me, and this is what she um, wrote out for me, because I always ask them to write it out so I don't forget the essence of what they're trying to say. But she was really struggling on finding re resources for a paper and in our old catalog. And she knew about our new catalog. She was our student worker, and we had it up as a separate um, option on all of our kiosks. And she went to that. And she started, she put in the same search terms and very quickly she was able to get those resources she needed for her paper and they were helpful. And which means she had more time to work on her paper. Um, and then finally, some of our other feedback from que the questionnaire that we recently did in um, October, November and uh, there, there's just been a lot of good feedback on the interface. I'm not going to read all of this, but um, I guess the end one we will inspire rocks. That's what someone said. But what I think is interesting here is some people are glad because they can expand their search and they're not, they don't get stuck and they can kind of make their way through and find the resources and the topics or find a topic they didn't know existed. But then they can also, if need be, you know, dig deeper into or um, bring it down a little bit if they have to. So it, it kind of helps both ways we're finding. And then finally, this is kind of my summary. This is an analogy from one of our faculty members when I asked him why he liked Inspire so much. And he likened it to the traditional, he, he likened the traditional way of searching, even in Discovery Lair, of, um, that he, he likened it to a straight snow shovel versus a bent snow shovel. And he said that the straight, sh um, the straight shovel means the user has to adjust to the tool, the shovel, or to, in our, in our um, context, to the library discovery search. And we're asking our students or our customers to actually adjust and change so that they can find what they need. Whereas the bent shovel was created to make the job as easy, easy and painless as possible. And that's kind of what we have found um, that this is what Innovative is actually building, that they're building. And yes, they're still building it. There are, <laughs> there's always tweaks that we need to make and it's not perfect, but they are building. And that's, I think, the, the important verb there is building. They're building a tool for the user rather than building a tool and asking the user to adjust to the tool. Um, so that's what we have found with Inspire in our year, about a little over a year journey with them. And um, I appreciate the time that you have taken to hear about our journey. And I'm gonna hand it back to Leah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Um, and between, before Martha begins her portion of the presentation, I have another poll question for the audience. Um, let's see here, stop sharing those previous results and go to my second poll question. Give me just a second here. 
Um, so we want to know how familiar are you with linked data and BibFrame? Would you say you are very familiar, moderately familiar, or unfamiliar with the terms there? Um, and I'll give you just a few seconds for votes to come in. If you have any comments about that, feel free to put them in the attendee chat as well. We'd love to hear from you there. Uh, so far, it looks like most people, 53, 54% are saying moderately familiar. Um, leave that up for just another second there. Um, right now, it's 17% very familiar, 55% moderately familiar, 28% unfamiliar. And it looks like votes are sort of slowing down, so I'm going to end the polling and share those results with you. If you have any other comments about whether you are very familiar, moderately familiar, unfamiliar, or anything else regarding link data and bib frame, throw them in the attendee chat. Um, but thank you for participating in the poll, and I will let Martha take it away with her portion of the presentation. Thanks. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Um, first, I want to thank Leah and the Charleston Conference for inviting us to present today. Um, it's really wonderful to be here with you all. Um, with the exception of the person who wrote that they have a PhD uh, with their topic in bib frame, I hope the rest of you <laughs> can learn something from what I have to say. Um, uh, so to get that started, um, we're going to begin with just a very short historical um, exploration of how libraries have shared and formulated metadata. So back in the 1960s, um, Henriette Avram worked with a small team of computer programmers to develop a library cataloging data format that computers can read. And as most of you probably already know, they did this. Um, the, the, the initial reason for doing this was to, to have a way to print the Library of Congress cataloging cards that many of us um, used to put into our catalogs without having to create our own metadata. So um, that took um, till 1968. Um, in 1968, um, Avram delivered MARC, which stands for Machine Readable Cataloging, to the Library of Congress. 1968, over 50 years ago. So today, uh, we are using a lot of um, uh, technology and uh, we have, we, most of us have a personal phone. We, uh, many people spend nearly seven hours online um, every day in one format or another. And our technology has progressed a lot with it. Um, believe it or not, um, our smartphones today have more computing power than NASA's Apollo 11 mission had available to them. So if MARC is not equipped to serve current library users' needs or to carry libraries into the future, then the question becomes, how does the cataloging community bring bibliographic data into the internet age? And we believe that the answer to that is BibFrame. So to go back to our timeline, in 2002, Roy Tennant, a library technologist, wrote an article um, that said that Mark prevented libraries from satisfying the current and future needs of library users because it was incompatible with modern programming languages. A few years later in 2008, the Library of Congress Working Group issued a report on the future of bibliographic control agreeing that MARC is out of step with programming styles of today. A few years later in 2011, the Library of Congress officially launched the Bibliographic Framework Initiative, which we of course know as BibFrame. So what exactly is BibFrame? It's a descriptive data model that makes library resources visible online because it is compatible with other web-based data. 
and it, it uses three core classes for bibliographic description. The work, which is, as you can read, the creative intellectual content being cataloged. And it includes things like authors and languages and titles and so on. And then the instance, which is the physical embodiment of that work. And it includes information like publisher, play to date of publication and format. And finally, item, the actual copy of the instance being cataloged. And this includes information like location and shelf marks and barcode. Um, for those of us who remember Ferber, it's, it's um, a little like Ferber, but, it, it, but the work is the combination of work and expression. And how does it work? It exposes, shares, and connects different pieces of data, information, and knowledge on the semantic web. We'll get to that in a second. Information on the semantic web follows specific principles developed by Tim Berners-Lee, allowing machines to understand its meaning rather than to simply report back data based on keywords alone. Once information is organized through these semantic web principles, Related information may be linked together, creating linked data. So if you Google Hamilton, how the heck does Google compile relevant information from different parts of the web to present to us? And the results from a Google search include many rel uh, relative, related resources, particularly in the right on what's called the knowledge panel. Um, so we're going to take a look under the hood to see how this can be done. So how is Google doing this? By taking advantage of existing data openly available on the web, and this is a screenshot of the linked data open data cloud. This cloud consists of thousands of repositories of data from geography, governments, media, academics, social media, and more including Wikipedia and its underlying knowledge base, Wikidata. The data in these repositories are structured in semantic triples consisting of subject, or in our previous search, Hamilton the musical, and a predicate, which in this case could be, is composed by, and then an object. And then, so the, the subject, Hamilton, predicate, is composed by object, Lin-Manuel Miranda. So the data is packaged in such a way that the information on the semantic web following these principles, the web can understand the meaning and the context, as we said before, rather than simple keyword matching. And once we organize information using semantic web principles, related information may be linked together, which is why we call it linked data. Stephanie did a wonderful job of describing Inspire Discovery and showing us some of the searches and how it can powerfully pull together disparate um, information. Um, so a little bit about how that happens. In Mark, everything focuses on the title, or in Mark speak, the 245. When we use BibFrame, as we have in Inspire Discovery, our users may relate any piece of the linked data to any other piece. Mark metadata is transformed into resources, um, which would be like titles um, and into contributors, like authors and composers and so on, and topics, which we would say in our Mark records are subjects. And this could help us answer questions such as, what did these two people both work on? Or what does the library have on these two different subjects? Which is exactly what Stephanie showed us in her demonstration, is the combining of multiple subjects or multiple people. So what, can, what could happen to our metadata as we start to use BibFrame and linked data? We know it won't be easy to change a framework for library metadata that has been in place for over 50 years. But here are some of the advantages to the transformation of MARC into BibFrame. As we saw with the Hamilton example, linked data makes library data accessible on the web, 
in a way that Mark just can't. So let's say a high school student searches Google for The Great Gatsby because they need to read it for their English class. The local library may own several copies, but if the library's record for the book is created in Mark, they would never know this from a search of Google because Mark data isn't indexed by search engines. But BibFrame uses data standards, programming languages, and URIs, which stands for Universal Resource Identifiers, to make library data compatible with the semantic web. As a result, search engines may directly read library data and then include it in the result of internet searches. Second, MARC records are not designed to easily make connections between different records, let alone to resources outside the library catalog. But BibFrame treats authorities as objects with resources, concepts, and people linked to them, both inside and outside the library's collection. And this allows users to make useful connections between resources and to uncover rich networks of information. And third, BibFrame's flexible and still evolving format offers the opportunity to better accommodate resources such as audiovisual ones and serials. Unlike Mark, BibFrame's framework creates a distinct separation between the physical properties of a resource and its intellectual contents. And each element in a BibFrame record is an independent piece of data. So BibFrame doesn't create records we create records in MARC. In BibFrame, we create a, a network of data. This was, when I first heard this um, expression, it was my aha moment in terms of what were the advantages and where, what we might be able to do with linked data. Because MARC was developed so that computers could talk to each other. And BibFrame was developed so that uh, we could talk to the web itself. Maybe that will help clarify things for you as well. Oops, I'm sorry, I went two, two screen, slides. Um, let me get, sorry about that. Here we go, apologies. So, bib frame in action. Um, in 2015, the Library of Congress launched its first phase of its BibFrame pilot project. The library trained 40 catalogers in linked data and BibFrame, and then had them create metadata within BibFrame. The project was a great success, and they launched the second phase in 2016 with 23 additional catalogers. The Library of Congress also enlisted the help of early experimenters in the library community to test BibFrame and provide feedback. And since then, the Library of Congress has collected extensive feedback from early adopters and incorporated it into the BibFrame model to make it as user-friendly and as efficient for libraries as possible. Based on that feedback, the Library of Congress launched a new and improved version of BibFrame in 2016, which of course was called BibFrame 2.0. With the Library of Congress propelling it forward, it's clear that BibFrame is the future of library cataloging. But what would that future look like? As a linked data model, BibFrame's future will include milestones such as, in the short term, making library collections visible online on the web. In the midterm, building the network of libraries using BibFrame. And then in the long term, developing a rich network of library-related linked data so that BibFrame may eventually result in a large collection of interconnected, authoritative metadata from libraries all over the world that is easy to access promotes intuitive discovery for library users and helps expose new users to our library resources. So as we said, the trans transition from bib to BibFrame will ultimately help us serve our library user communities better. And I'm gonna show a few examples. They're really what um, Stephanie already showed you, but we can give our user communities new tools such as the related resources that she showed as well. Those are other works that are in the collection that are related to the one that was already found by the user. And then related contributors, so that we can then start looking at what the diff different people have done 
uh, within that um, from that starting at that one title and related topics so that we can either branch out or focus in to find out what we need when we're searching the library catalog. If you're interested in learning more about how BibFrame works in Inspire Discovery, and I hope you are, here are a few options for you. Um, there's a, a, that URL on, on the left side um, will take you to a lovely video that was filmed at Cairn University where Stephanie is the library director, where Innovative interviewed Stephanie and university students on their experience in testing discovery. Or midwinter is coming up, visit us this weekend in Philadelphia and you could be a stealth visitor just like Stephanie's professor. Um, and we're in booth 1613 where you can come and chat with Innovative staff and ask us for a live demo of any of our products while you're in the booth. I'll be in the booth on Friday evening if you'd like to come and see me. Or you can use that contact me uh, form on our web to request a detailed demo of Inspire Discovery or any of our other products. This was a very brief description of BibFrame. Um, you, there's lots of more information on the web and I invite you to continue learning and continue exploring. And with that, Leah, we are ready for questions, I believe. Great, thank you so much, Martha. That was uh, very fascinating and informative. Um, and thank you, Stephanie, for your presentation earlier. Um, so we are gonna jump into the question part of uh, the session right now. So we have a couple of questions that have already been sent in that I will read out for uh, Martha and Stephanie to address. Uh, the first question is from Kaysen. How does Inspire deal with screen readers? It may take Stephanie a minute to unmute. Yes, there we go. Sorry about that. I can answer that. Just I um, slacked innovative at the same time that um, Mar Martha was speaking. So um, Inspire Discovery has been developed using the latest development tools and user interface design principles to be a fully accessible and responsive user interface. Our target standards are the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines 2.1 Level AA with the exception of 1.4.11 non-text contrast. Specific areas of emphasis include, but are not limited to, keyboard navigation, screen reader accessibility, and meaningful sequence. Thank you. Martha, do you have anything to add? No, I uh, have the same answer in front of me from one of our developers. So that's, um, um, I would have to just repeat the same information. Um, and we can probably copy and paste that into the chat if people didn't follow all of that. That'd be fantastic. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Matthew. What is an example of a BibFrame library collection that's available through a web search like Google? That's a great question. Um, this is Martha. The answer is there are some experiments happening now. Um, there's a group called LD for P, which stands for Linked Data for Production. They are currently working on a sandbox with a front end, and I think they're used um, to do so. There are several um, repository experiments that people have been doing where they're 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 formulating their metadata with um, linked data um, and putting it on the web. Um, there's a company called Zephira and what they do is work with, with library data to publish it onto a, um, their own platform, which is then um, uh, gets, gets crawled by Google and other search engines. So that was not a precise answer for a specific library, but I hope that that was helpful. Thank you. I'm going to jump over to the chat for a moment. There's a question there from Jennifer. 
Going forward for new clients, how would the development process or issue resolution work? Let me see. Um, I guess that would be for me, Martha. Um, the development process at the moment, Stephanie can speak to that. Um, if you decided, I, I assume we're talking about for Inspire Discovery. I just want to be sure that that's um, what they, what was meant. Um, so currently we are use, we are working with libraries who use the Sierra system, but we do plan to expand it to um, first to Polaris, which is another of our systems, and then to other systems. So to be a development department at the moment, you would need to be using Sierra. And um, again, you can use that, um, that, um, that link in order to ask for a, a demo and more information, um, if that's helpful. And uh, Jennifer, the person who asked the question initially confirmed that yes, it was Inspire Discovery that she was asking about. So that's okay, fine. thanks. I hope that would that at least partially answered your question. Thanks. Um, here is a question. Um, it's anonymous. How widely is BibFrame used among libraries? Will BibFrame become the standard within the next decade or so? BibFrame is being um, well, the Library of Congress is, is absolutely um, going to continue working with BibFrame. Um, I believe they have uh, transformed their entire uh, MARC bibliographic database into BibFrame. Um, the program, the PCC, the Program for Cooperative Cataloging Libraries, are very actively working with BibFrame. Uh, there are quite a few libraries in Europe that are doing so. Um, there's a big BibFrame conference that takes place in Europe every year. Ten years, I don't know. I can't, I can't guess. That will depend, um, I think, on how quickly libraries are able to do this work. Um, ten years, maybe by ten years people will be using it. I don't think it will replace Mark in, less, in ten years, but that's just a complete guess on my part. Thank you. Um, this is a question from Rick for Stephanie. Stephanie, you mentioned some great positive feedback you received. What kind of less positive, if any, feedback did you get? Um, good question. Actually, sometimes the most negative feedback is from us librarians. It doesn't work the way it used to. No. Um, uh, but actually, some of the less positive just has to do with um, the art Article metadata isn't there yet. Um, so a lot of times in our results, when you're doing the context wheel, you're not gonna get your article metadata um, as much of it that way quite yet. Um, location and where the call number is displayed and what is displayed on the search browse continues to be a big debate and um, we're just working on how what we want there versus what's too much information. Um, so that's been another one. And then one of the big ones um, was called it, it's the get it button that used to be there. Um, it's still there, but we use different terms. Um, it everything used to be get it and that caused a lot of confusion and that was just going through the sprint and the whole process and having feedback. I think those are some of the biggest um, negative responses that we've received. All right, thank you. Uh, the next question is from Katie. What do you envision for discovery and public libraries? Oh, that's a good question. I know we definitely plan to use public uh, to be working with public libraries. Our first two development partners have both been academics, but we have several public libraries who use Sierra who are very interested in working uh, to be a development partner for Inspire for public libraries. Um, we, I, we assume that with that, uh, and actually the carousels that Stephanie showed you were developed uh, we're planned to be um, part of what was developed for public libraries, but 
everybody said, oh, I want that. So, um, so, I, so it was added earlier on, but uh, public libraries should be coming in and using, the, using it and helping with how it develops very soon. Thank you. Okay, so another question. Let's see here. This next one is from Adam. For Inspire, does the library have to convert their MARC records to BibFrame? The answer is the library doesn't do that. The Inspire team does that. That's mm -hmm. part of the becoming a development partner. And I don't know, Stephanie, do you want to talk about that process for you? Um, Yes. Can we repeat the question? I got sidetracked with another question. Sure. How did your data get converted from Mark to Big Frame? Well, thankfully, um, not by us. Um, that's, a, that's all on the innovative side. It goes through, it gets ingested, and then Big Framed or Link data out, however you want to say that. Um, but we, we continue to catalog and mark. And just to say, we do use the Big Frame converter as part of that process that's available, um, publicly available. Got it. Thank you. A uh, question from Angela. Has any large institution greater than 2 million holdings used Inspire? Um, I don't, Stephanie, I don't know what your holdings are, and I don't know what the holdings of the other library that is currently using Inspire in a live environment is. Um, we have other libraries who are starting to get their data uploaded, so I don't think I can accurately answer that that question. I'd hate to just guess. Right, not yet. I, I think we're teetering cl close to there with electronic resources, but um, but not there yet. Gotcha. And then there's a follow-up question from Donna. Are there any public libraries using Inspire? There is one. Um, uh, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, Martha. Go ahead. No, you, Stephanie, you. Well, there, the one um, example that Martha was using in her presentation is actually a public library who's gone. That's right. Inspire. I had forgotten that. Yes, we do have one public. Okay. Um, a question from David. What can publishers do to ensure their content is compatible? Um, so I understand that one of the data sets that we are using for um, the context engine is Onyx data from publishers. So if you are outputting your data in Onyx, we should be able to ingest and use it. Okay. Let's see here. Um, so there's a question from Norman. How do records go from Mark 21 to bib frame? We may have our, did we already cover that or is that a, a separate question? We did. We used the yeah. bib frame converter. Okay. So question from Emily, what frame, what level of bib frame uptake and implementation are you seeing across libraries and publishers at the moment? So I think I, I sort of um, addressed that, talking about the libraries in the PCC Program for Cooperative Community um, community um, are, are working with BibFrame. There are other libraries as well. There's several grant-funded explorations. Mm -hmm. uh, the Library of Congress, there are various libraries across Europe um, who are doing so. In terms of publishers, I don't know. I don't think I, I wouldn't be able to answer that. Okay, thank you. Um, a question from Matthew. Can you already find resources that two people both worked on through library OPACs? Oh, you can, I'm, I'm sorry, let me just start over again. This is, I get, I right. you can already find resources that two people both worked on through library OPACs with Boolean searching why is linked data necessary to do this? And why can't it be achieved in a more user-friendly way with MARC metadata? Hmm. That's a great question. Um, and, if, and that it is true that Boolean searching can allow that. Um, what's different in linked data is that the links are already there. They've already been made. And so um, you can then span out. If, if you looked at the 
um, the, if you note, remember the context wheel where the list um, on the on the left hand side is, um, are all the people who were contributed contributed to all of the resources that were um, accessed at the beginning. So yes, you can do two in Boolean searching and three and maybe four, but it's much easier with the linked data um, in a bib frame format to be able to um, expand out and contract in easily. I hope that helps. Thanks. And I also think to jump in there, one of the things with what we're experiencing in Inspire is with the Boolean in the beginning, you have to know the terms. Whereas in Inspire, you're actually uncovering relationships that you didn't know existed. And if I may add to help with that, uh, how that works is the Inspire, um, the context engine, which sits under Inspire is, is preloaded with all of the innovative, I mean, not innovative, what did I say, the Library of Congress authorities um, both name and subject, as well as I think mesh. So the data is already there in the established format um, to be able to be um, presented to the users within the context wheel and searches. Thank you very much. So I um, was just noticing that we are coming to the end of our time. We're at the top of the hour here. Um, I'm going to maybe do one more question and then I know some people may have to leave, but I'll do one more question. And just as a reminder, if you do have to, to head out, this is being recorded and we're going to post the video um, and the slides on the Charleston Conference website within uh, just a couple of days. So I'll do one more question. Um, could you restate what you said about browsers not searching MARC data? I'm wondering how that relates to library content made visible through WorldCat. Um, it's true that WorldCat has is is um, has put the the bibliographic records um, into uh, to be searchable in a way. It's not the library's own um, bibliographic records, so it's it's the the base record that's that's made available along with of uh, holdings information. Um, and again, it's uh, that, you know, and then that relies on a library being able to remember to add and remove their holdings as they go along. Um, it doesn't really help with article content, as Stephanie mentioned, that's starting to be included. Um, and I guess that's my, those are my off the top of my head thoughts. Um, it certainly is helpful to have that. Uh, but I think with uh, the data being directly published to the web, it makes it, um, well, it's more accurate. It's what you actually have. And also, if you don't um, contribute your holdings to OCLC, um, then it doesn't help you. Um, and not every library does. Okay. Thank you. So we have a record of all the questions that were submitted that we did not have a chance to get to. We didn't have time to, to reach all of them. So we'll follow up um, afterward by email, um, unless you submitted the question anonymously, in which case we won't be able to contact you, but you can reach out to us if you still want to follow up on a question um, and don't hear back from us. Thank you to everyone who attended. Thank you to uh, most especially to our presenters, to Martha and Stephanie, this was fantastic. And thank you to Innovative for sponsoring today's webinar. I uh, really appreciate everything and I hope that you will join us back again next time for our next Charleston Conference webcast. And until then, have a great afternoon and we'll tell to all of you later on. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.